I'm up here in the mountains, man, with Kelly Nelson and his family, his brothers, and I have tried to get an interview out of Kelly forever, and man, he's always turned me down, but finally, man, he's agreed to give me a, a, a an interview, and so with that, Kelly, man, I'm excited, and, and hit it, tell me what you're going to talk about, and uh, man, I want the good stuff, too. Don't hold back on me. Okay. The good stuff. Well, before I start, I want to just express thanks to my wife and family for being patient with me as I've gone on many expeditions and looked at a lot of things and been gone. I want them to know I really do appreciate that and I also want to thank all of those that have researched this stuff of the Spanish in this area you know throughout the western United States um, and taking the time to put boots on the ground <clears throat> and really see what's going on out there not what we're just told in the history books and I want them to know how much I appreciate their efforts you know, the books that they've written, all the things that they have done, whether they agree or align with how I see the world, I want them to know that I appreciate what they've done. Um, I, from the time I was just a little kid, I've always been interested in history and archaeology. Uh, I didn't know how I could ever do that because I thought I'd have to go to Mexico or Iran or Iraq or Egypt, or something like that. And it wasn't until I became introduced to what we're going to talk about today that I realized that the history and the archaeology that I've been looking for is right in my backyard. And so that's been fun for me. And then I want to also make sure everybody understands that on one of my very first expeditions with Terry Carter, we had hiked into an area with my brothers and we were, we were looking at some carvings. And from these carvings we had noticed a, a triangle of huge white rocks right below us and we were going to go down and see those. and all of a sudden we heard somebody behind us and we turned around and there was a guy in camo with a sniper rifle and he escorted us out of that area. I'd forgotten all about that Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's that's one of my first memories of, of Terry being <laughs> escorted under gunpoint off of this property that we didn't know it was a problem to be there but apparently it was a problem that day. <clears throat> uh, I want to talk a little bit about growing up and as I was a kid, I really didn't care about the Spanish being in the area. I heard stories about them. And it's like, okay, so what? Uh, all they ever taught us in school was Escalante coming into the area. But I just, just I really didn't care. Uh, my dad um, started telling me a few stories as I was a kid. He told me stories about in Manti area that there was a black man that had befriend that the Indians had befriended him. And uh, one of them actually gave him a buckskin map uh, that had uh, the location of his old Spanish gold mine on the mountains west of the San Pete Valley. And this guy uh, went and looked for this for a long time. There was supposed to be a lake that he could see from the mouth of the mine. Uh, he looked for years, never could find it. There was uh, stories that the old timers told my dad that on, those, on the west mountains uh, there were over a dozen mines that uh, the, the old timers had found when they first came into the area and out exploring that they found these you know m evidences of mines around the area. He also told me a story of um, some Spaniards that were going across the west of the valley between Ephraim and Manti and were attacked by the Utes and after a couple days of battling they apparently chose to to bury their contents because uh, they couldn't escape with the mules weighted down and so they buried their contents and were able to escape. We don't know if they were hunted down and killed, if they lived, if they came back and retrieved it. Uh, but that, uh, if, that's, if there's truth to that story, that has never been, uh, the, to my knowledge, it's never been located. Okay? Those are stories I heard as a kid growing up from my dad. So, so let me stop you right there and, and, and add to that or ask you, because your dad's been passed away for quite a while now. If your dad was still alive today, how old would he be? 109. So your dad hearing these stories, it was a long time ago that your dad heard these stories. Yes. My, my dad was, he, he lost his father when he was nine years old. And my dad was the oldest in the family. And so to, to get, you know, male, uh, I mean, men in his life that could teach him things, he would go around and hear different things. And uh, in Ephraim, there used to be an old cabin uh, just east of where we grew up. Um, it belonged to a guy by the name of... Um, Andrew Tingling 
And Andrew Tingling would oftentimes gather the people, some of the old timers over, and they would, you know, play poker and stuff like that. And so dad would go over there to Andrew Tingling's cabin and hear these stories as these old timers are talking. And that's where he started hearing this stuff, is from those guys as they would sit around and gamble. And he was just a young kid. Yeah, he was like 10, 11 years old at the time, is when he heard these stories. So he also told me that, um, that he had heard that when the Mormons came into the area, that uh, Isaac Morley and Chief Wakara uh, met one day and they walked up on top of Temple Hill before the temple was there. And, Isaac Mor and Wakara was telling Isaac Morley about the Spaniards coming into the area and telling them, or telling him, how brutal they were and the destruction that they did and destroying things that were sacred to the Indians. And then how the black robes were there and enslaved the Indians to, and forced them to work in a gold mine. And I wonder sometimes if it's the same gold mine that this black man got the, the map from, you know, from the Indians. But while they're standing on the hill, uh, Wakara points, to, uh, I mean, points out an area to Isaac Morley and says, it's over there. And over there has revealed some very interesting things as we have researched, uh, the, you know, the Spanish in the area. So, he also told, um, um, or my dad told me that what he heard growing up was that there was a curse on the area, especially in the Sanpete Valley was sacred. And the Utes did not want the uh, Spaniards in here at all. And, you know, I don't know all the reasons why. The, uh, I heard from another source, uh, my brothers and I heard from another source, that the Sanpete Utes, always talked about an area that was considered sacred uh, by the Utes and was watched over and looked over by a serpent. And, you know, we have actually come on to a couple areas that could, could fit that description. And I may talk about one of them a little bit later here as we go. Um, well, no, let me just talk about them now, just for a minute. One area is where uh, we went in and we, we mapped this thing out and we had a, a man who was a, a former Catholic priest come in to help us because I'm not Catholic and I don't understand that religion. But he came in and helped us, help us identify that the area that we were looking at that was curious uh, was actually an area where they held mass. And he felt very comfortable identifying that the Spaniards had held mass in this particular area. Mm. Another area uh, that that we have, uh, in the area of where this supposed gold mine is, uh, we have since come upon some information that we know that it's very, very important to recognize solstices and equinoxes. And on the equinox, uh, here a few years ago, we discovered some things that are, are very suspicious that may very well connect the Aztecs to the area. Really? And we are still investigating that particular uh, thing. When I was a kid, there was a mountain east of Ephraim. Um, the mountain is called Bald Mountain. And we would go up there and just hunt. And we were about 14 years old. Went up there, we were hunting. Um, we stopped for lunch. And uh, we decided to move down. And we were going to go down to an area where there's a natural bridge. And then one of the kids hollered, hey, come over here. There's a tunnel. And uh, we all walked over there. and. Uh, looking to see what this was and here we found this this little tunnel about this big Going back in and so we left our rifles outside and all of us got on our bellies and we Shimmied in and we went back there about 20 30 feet and you could stand up and There was a lake Inside the mountain hmm. and we would pick up rocks and throw them back in there and you could hear it kerplunk And so it was pretty deep um, It wasn't until years later when I started looking at or learning about the Spanish and we discovered several things on Bald Mountain indicating the Spanish were there <clears throat> and there were monuments actually that were pointing uphill right in the direction of where this um, cave was but unfortunately in 1983 back when the year when we had a lot of wet there was a major slide on that mountain and it went right over the top of where that cave was and so we haven't been able to get in to verify knowing today I if if it was open and the Spanish monuments indicating to go up there It'd be really interesting to go in there with light and see if there was something of some kind cached in there or if it was just a water source. Out here um, on these mountains where we're at, and I'm not going to point out where we're at, but to the north of where we're sitting, uh, there's a, a, a canyon 
And if, several years ago, our one brother was, you know, doing some sheep herding in there and uh, riding his horse along, just happened to notice up on this little knoll a strange uh, rock outcrop, you know, a rock stack. And so we went in there later and investigated. And here you have a, a rock cairn about eight feet tall sitting there in the middle of nowhere. And it's like, what is this? And who built this? We didn't know about the Spanish at the time, and we just assumed the Indians built it for some type of an altar area or something that was sacred to them. Today, I do believe it is part of a monumented trail that goes across the mountains where we're, where we're meeting today. Another interesting thing that came up while I was growing up. Now, we grew up in the timber industry, and so we would work at sawmills and so forth. And one day at one of the mills, uh, they were running a log through, and boy, the saw hit something. And they backed it out and flipped the log over and they ran it back through on the other side and it hit something. So they took it off the carriage and took a chainsaw to it and probably axes to get in. And what they found were two uh, metal bars about inch by inch, about this long. And they were in a cross. And this was up about a good 40, 50 feet up the tree. And it was fully encased at that time. And we don't know who put it in there. Uh, was it the, intended to be a marker of some kind? The rods themselves you could take and you could hit them together and in one angle it was just a thunk sound. You flip it around, hit it again, and it would just sing. Really? And so we, but we don't know, but it was an oddity. And like, who in the world would, would go up there and, and put something like that up, you know, 40, 50 feet in a tree? And still at this time you don't know anything about the don't, Spanish? Don't know anything about the Spanish, okay? Um, there were stories about Spanish armor being found on the mountains west of Ephraim and Manti uh, when roads were being built. We heard those stories. And then uh, one story that I heard, I was in junior high, and uh, a particular man that I'm aware of, was his son was telling us that his dad had been hunting on the West Mountains and had been going up uh, an old trail that looked like at one point it could have been a, an ancient Tr you know, road, a cart trail or some, of some kind, but he's on his horse just going up and the horse stumbled. And so he, after the horse regained his footing, he got off to see what it was and he went back there and, and the horse had stepped on a gold nugget about the size of a golf ball. Mm. And, you know, the, his son was telling us this story when I was in junior high and later we talked to the man about it and he verified the story that, yeah, there was this gold nugget sitting there. Now, where did that come from? Uh, was it? Did it come from a Spanish mine on those West Mountains? I don't know, but nonetheless it was there. Now these are some of the things I heard growing up. Um, now, how in the world did I get started with all of this? <clears throat> um, about 27 years ago, my brothers contacted me about some stuff and they'd come on to... Uh, Charles Kenworthy had just released some of his his books. And they had seen some of it and thought, well, we've seen stuff like this. And I think, I think they bought them books from me way back when. I think they did. Was it Terry? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so, so anyway, uh, they uh, tried to get me to come and look. And I just, you know, I wasn't interested. I said, no thanks. And uh, earlier, this was like in about November time period, in April, they called me up and enticed me to come down and take a look at something and just give us your opinion. And so I came down. And I lived in, in northern Utah. And they take me out to this one area and they showed me this rock. And they said, what does that look like? <laughs> and I just looked at them like, I mean, how dumb do you think I am? I mean, it's, it's, it's a rock. And they said, do you see the heart? And I'm looking, I said, like, where? I, where's the heart? And they said, the whole rock is a heart. And if you've ever looked at 3D pictures, when you're looking at something, you just can't see it. Then once you get it right, all of a sudden the image comes out. That's how this was. The, all of a sudden I, I saw the heart. And there it was, as plain as day. And you could see it had been positioned. And on the flip side of it, there was actually a big old S carved in the rock itself. Well, they opened up Kenworthy's book. And they showed me a uh, heart rock. And I'm looking at that, and I'm looking at this, and it's like, these guys are brothers. I mean, how do you have something like this? And then they said, now, see the outcropping up on the hill? 
Okay, and now by now I'm starting to, I'm getting this idea, okay, I'm supposed to look at this differently. And I said, they said, what do you see? And I said, well, it looks like the profile of a man wearing kind of a funny hat. They opened up Ken Worthy's book to another page, and by golly, there was the brother to that guy up on the ridge. And at that point in time, they hooked me. And I've been hooked ever since. And I've been doing this for 26 years. <clears throat> um, I've read, I've studied, I have been all over trying to understand what's going on uh, with the Spanish occupation here in Utah and, and the Western United States in general. Um, and again, in the beginning, I was like a sponge. I soaked up everything. I would, I would read, I mean, everybody that has written, you know, information on the Spanish here in this area, uh, I, I read their stuff. And I won't mention who they all are. I mean, they know who they are. Many of you have probably read their stuff too. But I soaked it all in as gospel truth. And then I had a, a, an awakening, and I came to realize that not everything that's written is truthful. And some things are information left out, or maps were changed, or whatever was going on, so that people had information but would not get into the exact location. And so I, I started um, you know, questioning some of the things. About that time, I started hearing <clears throat> lots of criticisms about Charles Kenworthy, and I had, you know, by then had purchased all of his books and had read his books and studied them and, and was using them in the field. Um, but there was all these criticisms that I was hearing, and, uh, you know, things were on forums, uh, people's, you know, their different opinions, and, uh, and, I, and you know, there were, there were statements like, he purposely misled people, he lied. Um, they questioned his honesty and his integrity. Um, I didn't quite know what to think. I mean, I, you know, I'm a trustful person, and it's like, well, okay, you know, if they're going to write it, why don't you be truthful? Uh, I since come to learn that I only accept about 80% of what Charles Kenworthy wrote, and I will maybe talk about some of that in, in a minute. Um, I did have, during that time of, you know, trying to figure out how much to to uh, trust, had the opportunity to uh, cross paths with a couple of uh, Charles Kenworthy's associates. And one of them said, you know, I would rather follow Charles Kenworthy, who sees things in rocks, than a geologist, because I have personally been with Charles Kenworthy and have held mucho oro grande. Okay, that was interesting. Another one of his associates, totally unaware of what the other guy has told me, talked about when uh, Kenworthy was, was tracking down the lost Dutchman in Arizona that a lot of people throw out and don't think he think he's kind of cuckoo about this whole thing. Uh, Kenworthy talks in his books, and you can go get his book on the Dutchman and read it. He talks about the Cavern Concasa, and you can read a little bit more about that in his book. But this other associate told me the, um, that Charles Kenworthy removed $13.5 million from the Cavern Concasa in a very strategic, secretive way. So I'm, I'm trying to think, well, okay, then, is there, is there credence to what Kenworthy says or not? I, you know, and so we just started putting it to the test, started following, you know, the various trails. Um, now, I know there are people that will see this that totally disagree with Charles Kenworthy, that uh, they mock his research, they refuse to accept it, um, and, as, and, and there are people that are continuing to do whatever they can to show distaste in anything he did. And what's unfortunate about that is there are people who are very novice in this world of trying to figure out what the Spanish have done that hear this and they accept these people as, as you know, the experts, the professionals. And so they form these opinions about Charles Kenworthy and what he did. Uh, as though he's a kook, and they don't even study what he did. And, you know, it's, it's led to many people being influenced incorrectly, and I would, I would invite them to go do your own research. Don't just, just because somebody says it, don't accept what they say blindly, even what I'm telling you. Don't accept what I say blindly. Go do your own research and draw your own conclusions. Because, um, as, as I said, you know, there's I've seen things that, that Kenworthy never wrote about. 
I don't think he released everything he had. I don't think he received everything from the archives of Spain. I do believe that he was doing some things to mislead um, and misdirect for some, some various reasons. Um, but it doesn't mean that there wasn't something that he gave. I mean, he was out there doing, doing boots on the ground research too, and he took the time to write this information. And I believe there's about 80% that I, and well, I've actually found 80% of it in that range to be valuable information. Um, so, so, and maybe you're going to talk about, maybe you're going to mention this, maybe you're not, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't you and your brothers in contact with Kenworthy? We were. Because I know I, I met him down in, in uh, Apache Junction, Arizona, and he was going to take me on a little field trip, and then his dad got sick, and so he left, I, I, and I never really got to talk with him much in that, but I know you guys was writing letters back and forth in communication with him. and Yeah, our, our other brother, uh, he was... Had been in, you know, as we all talked about it, and so our, our older brother is the one that was kind of the the, the voice to initiate this. Um, wrote a letter, sent some pictures to Charles Kenworthy. Charles Kenworthy wrote us back and said, "Yeah, this is it. This is this, and this is this, and this is this." And we were making arrangements uh, to have him come up and actually see what we had. Uh, but he was busy with his Dutchman project down in in, in the Superstition Mountains. He sent uh, one of his associates up here with ground testing radar, GPR, and um, he came and did quite a bit of testing for us. I know he went back and told uh, Charles Kenworthy, this appears to be a virgin area and it's one that you need to be paying attention to. And so he was reaching, we had reached out, he had reached out to us, we were coordinating dates and times, and then he just went silent. And we didn't know what happened, and we, we followed up and we talked with Gladys, uh, Charles's wife and, he'd passed and, away. and he had passed away yeah just not too long after his dad passed away he passed away yeah 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 he had, had uh, not he had not he wasn't feeling good when he was down in Apache Junction area went back to California and was diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer and it killed him within just a few weeks and uh, and so he wasn't ever he was never able to come up but some of the things that people don't understand about Kenworthy and his pattern, and I learned this from one of his associates, uh, when people would reach out to him, he would, he would look at their pictures, he would, he would tell them, if you want me to come in, I charge $750 a day, plus expenses. If it is on federal land, I won't even look at it. If it's on private land, um, it needs to be able to be purchased, and I want 50%. Okay, and so if he's going to come in, you, you got some hefty upfront money you got to pay. And that was back in, oh, that was 25 years or so ago. Yeah, it was the 80s and 90s, yeah. And I learned from one of his associates, and again, I don't have proof or evidence of what I'm saying. What I do have is, and one of his associates told me this, that Charles Kenworthy was a 33rd, 33rd degree Mason. And by being involved with the Masonic Order, there were things that the Masonic Order was doing and they wanted him to change things in his books to not be uh, full disclosure. And so he would come in and look at sites and if he saw that they were related to the, you know, to the Masonic Order and their interests, uh, he would misdirect so that they could pursue this from a different angle. Now, I can't verify that. That's just what I was told. And that may be why some of, of we, as we've looked at some of the things um, regarding what he's written and people saying, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard, or he's lying, or he's just trying to do this to sell books. Uh, it very well may be some of this stuff was being misled because of this other association. That's a possibility. The, the one thing that, uh, that I was told when you go into his, his books, he will show a bell. And he talks about it being a church mission. It isn't a church mission. It's actually a church vault or a bank where the, where the, the church would, you know, would cash things. And so the Masonic Order was looking for those things based on what I've been told. Okay. Um, as I look at Charles Kenworthy's research, and, I've, and I've, as I've read everybody else's, 
I look at all of this stuff literally as one spoke in a wheel. You know, this, this researcher who's done this and this, this is his spoke of the wheel. Another one, this is his spoke. Your spoke, Terry, is this one. Charles Kenworthy's is this one. Uh, did he know everything? No. I don't know everything, and I'll be the first to say I don't know everything. But at the same time, I am not a novice at it either. Okay, But I do have lots to learn. And every time we go out on any form, type of an expedition, we always come back with more questions than answers. And so it's like we don't know it all yet either. But we do know that something's going on. We are able to follow this stuff. But the one thing that, that Kenworthy never released, and um, through other associates that I'm aware of that have talked with his family, there is information, but his family chose not to release it for whatever reason. But he never released how to... What he released was how to go in and find the location of mines and cache sites, but not how to find the spot. That was going to be what he would do when he came in and his charging and getting his 50%. So he never released that. And so a lot of us that follow this stuff, yes, we're able to get close, but we haven't quite figured out yet how do you get right to the meat. We're on the plate, but we don't know where the meat is. Okay? Um, or you're in, the, you're in the file drawer, but you don't know which file it, it's in. And um, I don't know that information. And I don't know if anybody knows that information, other than maybe his family that is aware of and it. Maybe they'll share it someday. But anyway, um, during all this time, I ran across uh, a man. And all I'm going to say is he is just a very knowledgeable friend from the American Southwest. That's all I'm going to say. Um, and I will protect his identity. But he, for whatever reason, sought me out and started tutoring me in not just field code, but it was in map code and document code of the Spanish versus another group known as the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits. And he's tutored me quite well. Um, again, he, he is a master at this. I am not. I'm learning. But with what he has taught me, I have learned that there's an incredible amount of um, codes that the Jesuits, Jesuits would use um, that most people are completely unaware of. And as we've worked on various sites, we've come to learn and recognize if, the, if this is Spanish or it's Jesuit. And a lot of people that I've actually talked with that have come to my home and we've looked at some of their stuff, it's like they're, they're finding themselves spinning in circles. And, and what we've learned is if you're looking at, at these at monuments, uh, the type that Kenworthy writes about, and you're just spinning in circles, uh, it may not be Spanish that you're dealing with. It may very well be that you're dealing with the Jesuit. And their coding, they may use similar things, but their meanings are completely different. And that's one thing that, that we have found uh, when we're looking at um, the Spanish versus the Jesuit. Okay? Let me just state some of these codes. Um, I, I, I'm not going to state how they were figured out and discovered. But I will state that they were the coding systems that were used by, by the Jesuits during the, the 1600s to the 1850s. Now, some people may say, well, they were all arrested. Uh, you know, back in 1767. Well, yeah, most of them were, but not all of them were. And I'm not going to get into to that at this point. But there were several of them that, that stayed up, you know, in the... American Southwest that, that weren't taken back in chains. And there's pretty strong evidence that that's the case. Now, let me, um, as, I, as I move into this next little part of what I want to talk about, I want to really make sure everybody understands that I am, my goal here is not to discredit others, uh, but it's to build upon the truth and to follow the data based upon the coding. That's all I'm about because I'm not going to discredit this person or this person for what they've done. I'm just trying to follow this based on the coding that I've come to understand. Okay? 
uh, some experiences. Uh, one area we came into, uh, we uh, found a tunnel about yay big, and um, it was completely backfilled. Uh, we removed the content of that, uh, at least 25 feet of that tunnel, uh, back in there about, oh, I don't know, uh, that far down in the dirt, about 15 feet back in the tunnel, we found a piece of wood, it was cedar, that had an axe cut in it. And so we know it wasn't Mother Nature who blew all this stuff in, uh, that this thing had been backfilled. And uh, there's been some people at that particular tunnel. Uh, that picture, a picture of those individuals have been posted on the, on the internet. Um, uh, believing that that tunnel was um, maybe one of Johnny Brewer's tunnels. And supposedly even posting a, a supposed map that was found in the area, along with a burlap bag and some digging spikes. Um, uh, just to clear the record, the burlap bag was my our burlap bag. The digging spikes were my digging spikes. There was no map. The, the thing was completely backfilled. There was no indication that anyone had ever been in there before. Um, there's other things going on in that area, um, but we call it the spider tunnel because later I crawled back in there one day and I was the smallest of, of the three of us and so my brothers always made me be the one to go back in and, and it was, there was a tight spot. Today I can't fit. A little bit too much right here, but back in that day I, I could fit through there and we, we knew some things in the back of that tunnel that we wanted to clarify. And so I was going in on my belly and I got in there so far and I just happened to, my flashlight just happened to look up. I mean shine up and I looked up and there were thousands, thousands of spiders all over the ceiling. And it, it just kind of freaked me out. And I got the willies and I started backing out and my brother said, what are you coming out for? And I said, there's spiders everywhere. And so I start backing out. And as I'm backing out, my light's hitting these spiders and they're just scampering. It's like they were creating a dust cloud on the ceiling, you know, they're scampering to get out of the light. And so we call that the spider tunnel. Okay, that's what's there. So, so let me back you up, interrupt you just a minute. Because I think this is pretty ingenious of them. Tell them what tell them what these digging spikes are. <laughs> well, I had a friend of mine make some some spikes that I could lace onto my boots. And um, one of them, when you when we went in there, you couldn't stand and dig. You couldn't swing a pick. You couldn't use a shovel. All of this had to be done with a hole. And once we got the first layer of this loose dirt out, then the bottom layer of this was more calcified and hard. And so I had to go in there and um, you know, go in feet first and I'd lay on my back and then I'd use my feet to, to try to break the dirt loose with these spikes that I had. And they had big old spikes like this on, on a couple of them on one side and the other one was kind of a V spike that could cut the dirt. And I really don't know whatever happened to them. I, I don't know if they disappeared from the spider tunnel by people who visited it or if I took them home and somehow misplaced them, but I don't have them today, but I do have photos and you have photos of, of those digging spikes and me coming out of, the, uh, of that tunnel with the digging spikes on. Seems like I talked to somebody that they found them digging spikes up there. At the, maybe they got them, I can't remember. Maybe, maybe they did, but, but they were not. And I know you left them up there. But they were not Johnny Brewers, <laughs> okay? So I'm, I'm just clarifying that. They were not John, John Brewers, okay? Um, very interesting area, uh, much more going on there than, uh, than obviously what I'm going to say here today. Uh, another area, let's, a lot of people have been at the sun face. But let me back you up again. <clears throat> okay. You want to talk about the death trap? We could talk about the death trap. Uh, While you're there? Yes, because actually one of the reasons we stopped going back in the tunnel was because 30 feet above, because this tunnel is 30 feet down in solid rock. 30 feet above, uh, my brother, our oldest brother, was up there and actually found a, a, a heart rock 
with a missing lobe, indicating death trap. Okay, and and the way the death traps were, if you look at Kenworthy's sketches, this area lays out to be like a treasure room. Okay, and when you go back in, as you enter into the rooms themselves, right as you go into the room from the tunnel, there is they'll put like a, a clay barrier, and and now you know that something's going on here and you start digging it because you're on your belly you can't see what's above you and literally right above you you're, you're removing the support for a one-ton rock that sits right up here and t literally intended when you remove enough of the debris it's it's going to come down and kill you and so now you become that becomes your grave all your other buddies can't get in because you're in there blocking the way and they leave whereas the way that the according to Ken were these research and sketches uh, when you come into these rooms, there's always a back shaft that goes in. And um, so we abandoned the spider tunnel because of death trap, when we came to learn about that. In the same uh, area, we came across um, a very odd, intriguing area. We started removing um, backfill. And we worked on this for months, maybe even about a year. and. Uh, I'm, I'm up there kind of we're moving the debris and there's there's a bunch of rocks and there's there were animal bones big like horse bones you know 12 feet down in the dirt mm. in this place and chicken bones rabbit bones scattered all through the dirt almost like they they threw their garbage pile in in when they were throwing in this backfill under this this thing we were working on and and I'm I'm up there and there's there's a group of rocks kind of connected and I'm I've got my the crowbar and I asked my older brother and I said um, do you want me to pop these rocks loose just to get them out of the way and he says no let, let's leave them so we left them uh, after removing enormous amounts of backfill and it almost coming down into just solid bedrock and nothing really going on um, I one I was had gone home <clears throat> had stopped at a, at a uh, prospector store in Utah Valley. Maybe it was yours. I don't know. <laughs> but um, I, I, I was drawn to this book on death traps. I went over and I looked at it. And I, and I thought, well, that's interesting. But I can't afford to get it today. And so I put it back. Three times I was drawn to that book. And I finally just thought, well, okay, I'm going to get it. And hope my wife's okay. So I bought the book. Over the weekend, I started reading it. And I start reading about the Grand Death Trap, and it is describing exactly what we had been under. That in fact, we have, the, we have the death trap symbols in two locations, and we had no idea that we were working under a death trap. But there it was. And so we literally abandoned that. Even today, when we go back <clears throat> in that area and check and look at things, um, I don't go under it. And when I realized I was standing up by these rocks, and I've since learned that those rocks that were connected, that is the release mechanism that triggers it. And these things are made to, to take out 8 to 15 people at one time, <clears throat> and then they will bounce down the mountain and scare the, anybody downhill, maybe even kill a few people. So I've been under one Spanish death trap, and um, uh, I don't like it. I never liked it, but... We couldn't figure out what it was. It was just weird. But uh, it's there, and if anybody ever runs across it or anything like it, don't, don't get sucked in. And I'll talk about another death, some other death trap warnings that uh, uh, we recently came on to here in a few minutes. But, so, so there's a little bit about death traps, okay? Uh, let's go to the sun, sun face in Diamond Fork. There's been all kinds of stuff written about that, p different opinions. Um, and I value every one of those things because all of that information coming has helped me learn. Um, it wasn't until, and, and I will, well, let me say it this way. It wasn't until there was an article <clears throat> written about the sun face and, and published in the Ancient American magazine that, uh, and I'm going to give the name and you can edit it out if you need to, but it was written by Utana Jessup. And that article, for the first time, of all the stuff I had read about the sun face, she was the first individual that hit the target. 
Um, <clears throat> she didn't hit the bullseye, but she hit the target. And I reached out to her, and that was the first time I met her. And uh, as we've gone in and we've looked at the sun face, um, we have learned, as we've applied Jesuit or Jesuit coating, the sun face isn't Aztec, it isn't Spanish, it isn't the hippies from the 60s, it isn't the masons that brought the water line down from strawberry. The, the sun face in Diamond Fork is Jesuit. And we have decoded uh, quite a bit of it. We know pretty much what it's telling us. And there is a particular day of the year and time of the day that the, the, the messaging that you really need to see and understand comes out on that sun face. And I'm not going to get into what that is because that's part of coding I'm not going to talk about. But uh, we feel very comfortable to say that it is Jesuit. It's not the other groups. Okay. Um, let's talk about Shot Put Man. The, let's talk the, about Shot Put the, Man. The one that you're, you're famous for. Um, it, it breaks my heart to see the current pictures of it. Oh, yeah. And the defacing. And so let me get on my soapbox about defacing and toppling things and ter ter ruining things. Whoever sees this, when you are out about, and if you're talking to other people, if you see other people, tell them to respect it. Don't destroy it. Because once these things are gone, they're gone. Amen. Okay? And we've, we've seen the crosses in Diamond Fork, at least the one, get defaced because of somebody's clever artwork. Now the shop put man gets defaced because of somebody's clever artwork. Now, shop put man... I mean, you found it how many years ago? I think it was back in the early 90s. Early 90s. Now, there were articles written, what, back in the 60s? About when it was used, it was painted red, white, and blue for some big celebration that Cedar City was doing. Have you read those things? No, I don't. I don't. Yeah, there's some articles that talk about that. And so people say it was, it was all constructed back in the 60s for this particular celebratory event that was going on in Cedar City. Interesting it's, thing. It's, let me let me just make a, a statement. It's it's pretty interesting that, that that was a celebratory thing, but nobody knew about it. Yes. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> okay. And then about what year did they tell you that did you learn that the transient was in there working on it? Um a little bit be before I found it. Probably I found it in the early nineties. He, he he they said he was probably in the late eighties. Okay. So they, they say that, that he was in there, he made it. They, people say that they'd seen him in there, you know, working on it. And so this, it was made by a transient, you know, this guy who was bored. Well, okay, so what's the truth? <clears throat> um, when I, when you, you took us in and showed it to us years ago, mm -hmm. um, there was no evidence of any re residual painting of any kind from the red, white, and blue. Mm -mm. Nothing. Um, I've been told that lichen readings have been taken from between the fingers. And that those, now this has been like from 20 years ago, that those lichen readings were about 140 years old at the time, which that kind of puts a kibosh on the 1960s red, white, and blue and, and made by the transient thing. But the, the thing that's really interesting is when you apply Jesuit, I should say Jesuit, I'm trying to pronounce it correctly, Jesuit, uh, Jesuit coating to shot put man. Um, I'm very comfortable to say the transient didn't make it. It wasn't made for the celebratory event. The Spanish didn't make it. The KGC, possibility, but more than likely not. But the Jesuits, it's pretty tight that they were involved in the construction. And when you were there at the right time of year and the right time of day, there is a, a sequence of messaging that comes out in um, the perspective that the Jesuits would use that communicates a whole message system. And when you recognize it and you follow what it's telling you, you literally pick up a monumented Jesuit trail and it's pretty impressive. And I would, I would submit, uh, based on what we understand of it, that it is a rendition of John the, the Baptist who was, his mission here was to prepare the way to find Jesus. Jesus being 
the mine or the cash site that people are looking for. And that's all I'm going to say about that. But that, that trail has been followed and, and do documented and photographed and uh, we're very comfortable uh, putting the Jesuit label on so, shop put man. So, so I haven't heard of anybody really talking about the monuments in that area or the, you know, I, I didn't follow it, but I found a few of them and I, I've kept quiet about it. I found a heart, a couple uh, monuments, and and but I just haven't spent a lot of time down there like like you guys have. Well, you remember the day we were there? Yeah. We we left and we went to hike over to where the the uh, the carvings are the mystery the, glyphs. the mystery glyphs. And along the way, we found that one rock that's been lifted up. Yep. And f baseball, softball-sized rocks have been placed under it. Yep. Um, there's, there's that monument in the area. There's an elephant monument in the area. There's a lion monument in the area. Uh, so there's a variety of different things. But, the, but that's not the trail that the Jesuit trail is leading to. It, it leads completely away. And... Um, and, and when people understand, if it's leading you to Jesus, okay, Jesus being representative of a, a cash or, or mine, um, if you go back and biblically look at things, knowing that the, the educated people in that day were the priests. It wasn't just the, the, the construction workers, okay, it was the priests. The priests would pull all kinds of things from the Bible and build code from the Bible because they were the ones that could read it. We know from the Bible that when Jesus was crucified and was buried, his tomb was covered by what? Do you know, Terry? What his what was his tomb covered by? A uh, a, a rock around a round a round rock. Yeah. So now I know Gordon is not on camera with me. But I'm, he's in the background, but I'm going to have him tell you the end of the trail that we've been able to follow so far points to a rock. What shape is the rock, Gordon? Round rock? Round rock. So in other words, John the Baptist is, is preparing a way to find Jesus. You follow the Jesuit monumented trail and it leads to a round rock. A rock covering the tomb of Jesus. Okay. So that's what's going on down at the shop put man. And someday maybe we can go down and look at that. And, okay. let, and let, let you see it. So you can see it literally with your own eyes as these messages unfold. It's a date. Okay. <laughs> um, another one I want to talk about that was kind of fun for me. I was in uh, southern Arizona uh, working on a project there. <clears throat> and um, had the opportunity to visit what I refer to as the Kenworthy Pit. Okay, now Charles Kenworthy back in 1974, before he ever released his books, a matter of fact, he didn't even know about the stuff from the archives of Spain at that time. Uh, he found a, a pit, five feet by five feet dimension and five feet deep, covered by about a foot deep or wide depth uh, of a capstone. And they found it with a metal detector, and they were going after. Um, looking for one of seven, any of 17 suspected Jesuit cash pits. And they hit on this one. And uh, according to the articles written about it in, uh, I don't remember the magazine, um, Treasure Hunters magazine or something like that, he talks about what was there. Um, if anyone has that, that magazine or the articles, I will tell you this, that um, his description of the site and what happened uh, isn't correct. He, uh, when he talks about being north, it's not north. It's a different direction. When he talks about there was not this in it, it anyway, a lot of stuff is not correct with the article. I think it was literally he didn't want people in there disturbing so because they, they were still researching. Okay, But over a thousand silver bars were removed from that. We suspect a few gold bars. Um, and that is based upon um, information that we have gleaned from people who were in the know at the time. Um, there is the the it's the article says that there were no artifacts. Uh, I've had a chance to be at that particular pit. It's impressive. It's cut right in solid rock. Um, 
it's not five feet deep anymore it's about three about two and a half feet deep because mother nature has filled it in but on the one side there is a clear indication of a an alcove the top of an alcove and I thought okay if you're digging a pit and you're just going to put gold you know gold or silver bars in it why would you cut an alcove well it would be for for a, a, a statue of the, of the Virgin Mary or a statue of one of the Saints okay tell these guys why would they do that I mean they was they had to do that they had to do that tell them why well maybe you better elaborate because I'm not sure what you're after <laughs> oh okay they just no go ahead I won't I'll well be let, 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 let me just finish okay. okay so I have suspected because that alcove is there that even though the article said there were no artifacts I just don't buy that I, I buy the, that there there had to have been a statue a silver or a gold statue of some kind in that alcove when when Kenworthy hit the pit okay now I'm aware that ten pits have been found over the years I've been to three of those pits and the uh, I, I won't get into stories about about that other than the, they are kind of fun to see when you actually see this this was history right here and it goes back to what I said before I my interest of it was history and archaeology and to be able to stand right there and with all the stuff people have said about Charles Kenworthy and their negative comments uh, I've been at, the, at this Kenworthy pit and it, it's real it exists but the article is not correct okay I'll just leave it at that okay um, another area uh, that's kind of fun and I'll just say in the vernal area <clears throat> um, we became aware of um, a friend of mine who sent me a picture saying do you think this rocks a turtle rock and I said well it could be um, but you know more than that I'm I'm interested in the arrow what arrow I said well you got a light colored arrow over here pointing down into a crevice and he hadn't even seen that and so I tried to get him to go check in the crevice he wouldn't he never did two years later I a totally different source sends me a picture do you think this is a turtle you know a turtle monument oh it could be a uh, different time of year the first picture was in the winter time this picture was in summer and uh, taken from a different angle you could not see this arrow that was a light colored arrow I said but um, have you did you check out those white rocks over there in that red dirt what white white rocks they hadn't even noticed them and so Gordon and I we couldn't get these people to go over and look at this crevice and check this stuff out so Gordon and I finally traveled out in that country and we went there and we saw the arrow uh, we went to the white rocks the white rocks were interesting uh, they have been positioned one of them actually has what we call a view station and a view station is where you sit your carcass down there's a place for your boots and it forces you to look at something so I put my binoculars up what am I supposed to see and off in the distance I see carvings we go to the carvings we look at what it's telling us to do and the direction it's telling us and why we're there we decide well we're right here let's go check this crevice out because the white arrow or the light colored arrow um, we go there and right there in the crevice a cross to the side of it an A and an S with three dots around the S all of this telling me the turtle treasure the cross church we have a church treasure to, and to find it you have to go to the south or Sud the south and look for a triangle which we have done and the triangle was found okay and there are other things going on there but these are just some of the fun things that are going on that uh, when you are aware of what you're looking for you can find some pretty interesting things um, sometimes things are on federal land and you can't be doing this um, sometimes they're on parks and and uh, national parks and you you can go in and experience it but you can't go dig okay and you have to be very careful of that so that's something just about a turtle that was kind of fun for us um, 
Now, today, we took you out on a ridge. Mm -hmm. And we're showing you a variety of uh, rock stacks. Mm -hmm. and let you do some taping, you know, recording of what these things look like. Um, we came onto these, well, we've known about them for a long time, but we didn't put the, you know, the, the, the connection of the Spanish with it until about 25 years ago. Um, the old trail, the old Spanish trail, comes up about 20 miles east of Farron. And, and when you come up Farron Canyon, I mean, you, you are drawn into Farron Canyon as the old trail comes back and you start going down towards the Fish Lake, you're drawn into Farron Canyon. And, and from Farron Canyon, you, you have a monumented trail that goes clear across the high plateau of the central Utah mountains, um, goes across, clear across the San Pete Valley, goes clear over to Chicken Creek, and beyond. And the monuments we were at, they're old. Uh, we showed you, obviously, one that uh, it had actually, we have pictures of it before it was toppled. Some kids came in in a truck and plowed into it on purpose to push it over. Terrible. The, fed, the Forest Service uh, archaeologist was made aware and they tracked the kids down. The kids had to rebuild it. And it, it doesn't look like it's anything ancient today. That particular one prior to it being toppled, we were told was built by um, an older gentleman that we know uh, that was, when he told us this was well into his 80s, uh, he said that it was done by his dad when his dad was a sheep herder. His dad built all the monuments on this ridge. Well, looking at it today, you, you will notice in, in the video and so forth that this construction pattern is different of the one that was toppled, and maybe because the kids rebuilt it, but even the pictures we have show that it's a different design than the big one. And you'll, be, you'll show the big one. The big one is circular. It's hollow in the middle. It has two pointers. And there is a particular place you stand. And it puts you right in front of a view window. And opposite of that view window, you can put a stick up on the one pointer. And it's dead center in the view window. And when you take, and you take your compass direction off of that, and it leads you eventually to Chicken Creek. Hmm. Okay. Uh, there's another one, smaller one, that's just down the hill. And, and it has view windows and pointers on it that lead you to different areas to the south. So those have been fun for us. And I, I hope that you're going there today and seeing these was, was entertaining. You guys showed me pictures of them a long time ago, and I was jealous I wanted you to take me to them, and you never did. <laughs> <laughs> but, man, tell them why you, you mentioned Chicken Creek. What's special about Chicken Creek? Well, Chicken Creek... Um, Besides it being a, a fun place to go, uh, there was supposedly, again, I wasn't there, I only read the stories, but the, apparently there was a massacre of Spanish or Mexican miners there, and uh, there were some maps that were recovered off of these Mexican miners that, that led up into the Uinta Mountains. Um, but is that the part you're asking about? Yep. yep. Okay. And, and there's a couple meadows, and it, it happened in a meadow, apparently. And there's a couple meadows, that, and you have to know which one you're looking at. And I'm not going to specify which one it is. But um, when you were aware, uh, the, coming into the, to the particular meadow, I can tell you this. The trail that goes from the east to the west gives you, when you find the last directional marker, it gives you the exact distance that you need to go to the meadow that's important. And when you're at the meadow, there is also um, monuments in the distance that verify that this is an important place and, uh, and, and a place where uh, you're okay to, to, to camp and rest and, and cache things. Okay? And I'll just leave it at that. But so Chicken Creek is a very interesting area. And Chicken Creek is, is monumented, going up as well as down. And I'm sure that uh, over the years, a lot of these monuments have been destroyed, where roads have been made because a lot of roads follow the old trails and, and monuments get ruined. But there are monuments along the way. Uh, we have a, um, a date on the, on the last big monument that, that gives us the, the distance to the meadow. We have, when the lighting is right and you can see it in the rock, it appears to be the, the year of 1718 on this rock. Now if that is correct, this still puts us years before years before Father Escalante 
came up here. And I, and I firmly believe that he was not the first Spaniard up here, he, he or Dominguez, that they were up here, uh, not them, but others had been up here for years before, years before. And there, that's another story. I don't know if we'll talk about that today or not, but that's another story. Um, there's a odd rock wall out in the middle of the sagebrush that when it was uh, when I was shown it, the sagebrush was four or five feet tall, and it's about 250 feet square. One side's not completed. Um, it's just weird. It's like, what is this doing here? Now I I can't I can't verify what I'm telling you, but I've been told that lichens were taken from that rock wall and tested, and came back at about 420 years. Now if that's true. That's not Spanish. The Native Americans didn't do that. So who did it? Now, if it, if it ties back to the Aztec, it, you, now you're starting to get into a time period that is very interesting. And, you know, I mentioned that some of the things that we're, we've come on to are, are very suspicious that we may have Aztec activity, having been in the area. We don't know what that activity is. But I, but I will tell you this, that that there, I mentioned, you know, that the San Pete Ute said that there was an area that was watched over, a sacred area watched over by a serpent. Okay. On the equinox at noon, uh, Gordon just happened to be, we happened to be in the right position. He happened to look up and you have a whole hillside in the shadows except for one area. And this area is a rock that has been positioned, huge rock, about the size of a normal garage. Huge rock that has somehow been positioned. And at noon on the equinox, it, the left side is an Aztec warrior, a profile of an Aztec warrior. You see his, his earplug, the whole bit. The, um, the rock itself is in the shape of a heart muscle. And then there's a shadow that looks like a black obsidian knife coming right through the heart. Which the Aztecs, you know, they did stuff like that with the hearts and so forth. As, as the sun moves, because it's only on that one spot, as it moves, all that stuff fades away and the rock itself turns into a serpent head. Mm. Now, is this the area that the Utes talked about that is sacred? That's being watched over by a serpent? Or is it the area where they held mass? Well, we don't know. That area is still being investigated and, and trying to find answers. Like I say, we go into places and we come back with more questions than answers. Let's talk about the stone face on the, on the North Fork of the Duchesne River for a minute. That one, uh, you know, they say that, well, somebody was up there in the 1920s, you know, working on it and made that and da 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 da. And so I went over and we looked at it and it's intriguing and I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm, I'm looking at it from a Spanish perspective, not a Jesuit or Jesuit perspective. Um, well, okay, if it's Spanish, it's telling us this, this, and this. But if, if, if it is, there has to be a verification somewhere. And I looked around and sure enough, there is a verification that the Spanish have done on that particular rock formation, letting them know, letting any, any passing Spaniards by, they would know, this is something we're using, so pay attention to it. And literally what it is telling you is this, and, and I've told a couple other people, they've, they've gone and researched this, they came, came back and reported to me, but if anybody wants to investigate it, because I'm not going to, I'll tell you this, that the, the, the left of the monument, when you look at it, the left is a foot with two toes, telling you walking distance, two leagues. The right is the face. The forehead is, an arrow, is a pointer, pointing down, outward bound. The face itself, the, the, as you're looking at it, the left eye, or sorry, the right eye, as you're looking at it, is blind, is, is closed. The left eye is open. It's the same as the sun face in Diamond Fork. As you're looking at it, this eye's closed, this eye's opened. Okay? The nose casts the shadow of a T. 
tesoro, treasure. The chin becomes a pointer, and it points right up the, through the area, right up onto Lightning Ridge, or no, it's up on the soapstone, up on the soapstone. And uh, it's walking distance, two leagues. I've not walked it. I've, I've told people to go there. They reported back to me that they got up in there in the area and found uh, carvings on trees. Compasses wouldn't work, they just spin. Um, they came on to somebody's, you know, working a mine. And I said, leave them alone. You don't want to be a claim jumper. Uh, people get shot that way. So just leave it alone. But they also found markings on trees that said the trail was continuing. I says, go follow it. So I've not followed that. I just know what it's telling me to do. So my take on the, on the, the, soap, or the North, Duchesne sun face is Spanish. Okay. Um, let's talk about the, the, the stone face at Delta. A lot of people look at that, it's a natural volcanic bubble up, but it does have a profile. When you're looking at it, it looks like definitely a man, okay? When you're on the right angle, it, it just looks that way. Um, there have been some people I've heard that have gone in the direction of where this man, this face is looking, and figure that's where Spanish treasure is cached. And I'm just telling anybody that's out there that thinks that, that's not right. It's not correct. That's not what it's telling you. Uh, but is, is it legit? Is it just a natural bubble up or were they using the natural bubble up? Did they enhance the stone? You know, volcanic rock's pretty hard to enhance. It's pretty hard. Um, right behind it, if you're there at the right time of day, you can look up and you see right behind it a silhouetted stone that has a perfect V pointing right at the nose. That stone has been enhanced. It's pointing at the nose. It's telling you that your directional beacon is in the direction that the nose is going. And when you go and you're looking for the monumented trail, you pick it up and you keep following it. And we have followed that trail for 20 some miles. Mm. Okay. So that one is Spanish. Okay. Um, let me talk about. Uh, let me talk about the Uinta Mountains for a minute. Most of my our time is not in the Uinta Mountains. There's so many people over there doing stuff. We just there, there's enough in the rest of the state of Utah to keep us busy. And so let the people that want to spend time in the Uinta Mountains, they can spend time in the Uinta Mountains. Uh, but several years ago, our nephews were uh, and we're timber cutters, okay. And I'm not proud of the fact that we have to cut timber that has history on it. But when the Forest Service marks trees and you're hired to cut it, you cut it. And so we had a couple nephews who were cutting uh, over in that area and they came onto some trees that were had, been, had blaze marks in them. They called us, we, we went over there, uh, took a look at them. We followed this blaze trail for quite a ways. Um, they had actually uh, had cut a tree down that had a double blaze mark in it. So it had been blazed once and then years later it's been blazed a second time. We, um, we took a chainsaw and we cut through those blaze marks and unfortunately, you know, three or four feet of that temp piece of timber didn't get to be used at the mill. But we, and, and so we flipped it up and we counted the rings. The, from the, the first blaze mark, and let me just look at my notes here because I wrote this down. The first blaze mark uh, out to the end and these rings are tight and we were using as fine point as we could to try to count the rings. 270 rings from the first blaze mark. Mm. From the second blaze mark, 140 rings. Now, the second blaze mark easily could have been, you know, trappers or pioneer era. But 270, that's, that's not the pioneers or the trappers. And so what's sad is that the, the federal government, the Forest Service, has been going through and destroying, you know, monumented trails on trees. Um, because they don't understand this stuff. They, des they destroy cabins and things that are up in the mountains. I mean, I have a friend who was on the burning crew and he said, and he's a historian and it just, it broke his heart to have to set torch to some of these old cabins. And he says, I knew they were mining cabins, but they set the torch to them and burned them down because they were told to. Boy, that de that's, de that's destroying history. It is destroying that makes, history. That makes me mad. 
Uh, let me talk about this one for a minute. The dolmens at Fish Lake. Do you know about the dolmens at Fish Lake? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, very intriguing. Uh, took a while to find them, but found them. And I'm very comfortable to say they are, they are not dolmens, but they are Spanish treasure trail monuments. And we have followed the trail from above that leads to them, and we know where they're directing. And if it was somebody just making a dolmen passing through, we shouldn't have been able to pick up the trail. But those are Spanish. And clear up in, on the Fish Lake Mountain, uh, we, we picked up the trail that leads right down to them, uh, out there in the middle of the pines. And uh, one area, the, the trail has been so well traveled that the, the rocks themselves are just broken into pieces. So something was going on there, but I do not accept them as dolmens. They are, they are Spanish monuments, and I've seen other Spanish monuments that look just like it. So what about, do you know about the, the guy, they did a video on him back in the 60s or something, showing him, he said he built all these while he was out sheep herding. Well, not, not the dolmens or the Spanish monuments, the rock stacks. Okay. Okay, the rock stacks, you know, he claimed he built them. Yeah. Now, I've, I've been to those rock stacks. I've looked at them. I've, I've studied them. Um, one person couldn't do them. I know that. One person could do some of them, but one person could not do all of them. Some of them rocks are pretty big. They're pretty big, and they're pretty tall, okay? And the amount of lichen growing on them is incredible. Now, I understand lichen grows differently based on its environment. I get that. Um, but it is interesting where the old Spanish trail comes up past the fish lake and comes up over that hill. That's where the old trail was. So you think maybe he built some of them, seen them, and built, start building some of his own and claimed them all as his? Well, I think, it's my opinion. And he, I, he showed in that video he was building some, um, and he'd been building them for like 50 years or something like that. This is, this is my opinion. Okay. And again, remember, I, I don't know everything. Right, right, right. Okay, but my opinion is he has had hands on them and he may have built some of them, but I do not believe he built them all. And it's, it's no different than the guy who, who's, who said that his dad had, had built those other rock cairns. He may remember that his dad saying something and just made the assumption. Yeah. And sometimes people will say things um, that's not entirely correct. And speaking of, of that, and I know we're not going to talk about this, but let me talk about this one. Um, there's a place we came on to, a, a big old rock cairn we saw one day, and we thought, we're going to hike into this and check it out. We hiked in, and, and we get there, and it's, you know, it's a monument that's probably about, I don't know, six feet tall or so. And we find a little plastic bag stuck in the rocks. And we zip the plastic bag, pull out this little box, and here's this note that says, this is Harry's monument. It was built by Harry, a sheep herder, back in the 1920s. Please sign your name that you've been here. Okay. I guess he was a bored sheep herder. And we, anyway, we started looking at it. And uh, we noticed on the north side, there was organized construction in the first three feet of the monument. But that was the only, other, that was the only place. Everything else was just rock stacked. And so, to me... It was, it, it was an organized monument <coughs> that was tipped over, whether Spanish tipped it over, the natives tipped it over, somebody tipped it over. Harry comes along in the 20s, is bored. Huh. He goes back and just starts stacking it in no uh, in organized fashion. So, but, it, but Harry built the monument. And so when you go back down to the fish lake, did that gentleman do the same thing? Did he just add to were some toppled, did he build them back up, and then just claim that he did them all. Yeah. I have a really hard time accepting that he did them all. I may be wrong, but they just look too old and too complicated for one person to do. I don't know how you can get rocks, and maybe you, when you do this, you, maybe you should find some pictures and put some of those in and show how intricately they are and balanced they are, because I don't know how one person can do that. It may take three or four people to position it just right and get it just angled right so it doesn't fall over. So that's my opinion on those. Um, little Cottonwood Canyon. 
Now this is a story, and, I, and I'm saying this and so it can be recorded. My brother-in-law, his sister was married to a man that uh, years ago, back in the 60s or 70s, came across a document or map that he was able to figure out. It took him into, up into Little Cottonwood Canyon, up by the Alta Ski Resort. He uh, w went up there, he found the old Spanish mine that it was referring to. He talked with the Forest Service, talked with Alta Ski Resort, if he could get permission to be in there. They granted him permission for just a short period of time. Um, he definitely had to be finished and have it covered up before ski season. Uh, he opened it up, uh, got back in there, and there's supposed to be gold left over from the documents from some of, their, uh, uh, some of the other miners that were killed in, in an Indian attack. So they get in, uh, going back in here, <coughs> the gold is gone. But because of the, his, his uh, type of stuff he did for work, he took samples, soil samples. He took uh, wood samples. There was an old wooden plank in there that looked like it been used for sliding stuff on it. Um, the results of that came back that, that there were gold slivers from the plank. So they'd been using the plank for sliding, apparently, gold bars. The soil was really interesting. It came back with fabric samples from two different time periods. Hmm. <clears throat> one was early European, 1700s, and the other one was 1850, Pioneer era. And the only thing he could draw the conclusion on was pioneers, you know, the, when the settlers first came in, got up there exploring, came onto the mine, found the gold. Uh, there was a rock wall in there um, that, according to what he came to learn, that the remains of the Spaniards that were killed in the attack were behind the rock wall. And they, they left that alone. They didn't disturb that. So that's a story from, and actually, Little Cottonwood Canyon is monumented. From the Jordan River, you can look up and you can see the big doorway, and it tells you there are two trails that go in, one for animals and one for people. The animal trail is going to be more gradual, but longer, and the animal trail is going to, or the people trail is going to be steeper and faster. You see that from the Jordan River. When you go up in the canyon, they've done so much blasting and road work, you see no monuments other than in the mouth of the canyon. But that, that's a story about that. Um, talk about death traps. Um, let, I'm going to go back to death traps just so people are clear. Death trap symbols, I mean, Kenworthy pretty much tells what they are. They're, they're hearts with a broken appearance. They're, they're hearts with a lobe missing or a crack through the lobe. They're hearts with a lightning bolt coming through them. Uh, or skull faces. Uh, skull faces, you know, are associated with death. So if you're going to be out messing around and you see a skull, skull face, be very, very careful. Because if you're, if you're not careful, and, and let me go back to the sun face. At the right time of year and day, this sun face and diamond fork, the message that you get, uh, one of the messages you get off of that is, um, there's, there's, there's the five, six sun rays. There's five of them that actually point up. And there's one points down. And there's kind of an indentation there. And people say, well, it's bullet holes. People have been shooting at it. And no, that's not what's happened. It is intentional carving. And at the right time of year and day, it creates a dot, a shadow dot, by the sixth ray. Six with a dot. Go look up in Kenworthy's books. It will tell you that is a death trap symbol for bad air. And if you end up going and following, you're going to get in a situation where there's bad air that will kill you. Okay, that's one little thing on uh, on the sun face. Okay, when it comes to death traps, so uh, respect those things when you see them. Uh, they're not intended to. I mean, they're intended to to invite you in, to kill you, not to help you. And so respect those and. Um, my brother and I, just uh, a month ago, uh, were hiking out in the west deserts of Utah, checking some things out. Came onto a very odd area, and it just, it was like, I've never seen anything like this in all my hikings before, an area like this. And we're looking at it, and we got in, in this, a certain angle, and I said, well, stop. I said, look right there. And there was a, a partial heart with a lightning bolt right through the lobes. And it's like, okay, this is a, a, a trap. And, you know, talking with an, another associate of mine, 
his encouragement was walk away don't don't even waste time there because even if there's something there you're going to trigger something and you're not going to live to tell about it and so we walked away and we won't go back to that spot so those those things are out there and people need to be aware of them um, I want to talk about really quickly um, I had an opportunity several years ago to be introduced to um, a guy from Spain and a guy from Mexico that said that they had been uh, they were up here looking on checking on family holdings is what I was told and they come they come here about every four or five years just to check on family holdings their family has been in the mining business for over 700 years they they own they owned a company back in those days called the Josephine Mining Company. And they kind of chuckled when we were talking about books that have been written about the lost Josephine. And they said, uh, the writers here, they really don't know what they're talking about. The lost Josephine? No, we own the Josephine Mining Company. <clears throat> we had multiple mines in that company. Mine one is over here, mine two is over there, mine's three there, mine's four there. And, and they said, so when you guys start talking about the lost Josephine being down in Arizona or in New Mexico or Colorado or Nevada or in the Henry Mountains or, in, or on Hoyt Peak, um, they, they, they may be one of the Josephine mines, but there is no lost, singular, Josephine mine. And at, when I was talking to them, I said, so... Does that, um, is that the Josephine de Martinique mine? And they looked at me with a blank look like, we don't even know what you're talking about. No, it's the Josephine mine. Now, I don't know if the, Joseph, if the mine on Hoyt Peak is, is the lost Josephine or a Josephine mine from the Josephine Mining Company that belonged to these people. Um, what's interesting, they told me this, that <clears throat> they fully expect <clears throat> that the United States will collapse and Mexico will take this country back and Mexico will allow them, because they're still mining down in Mexico, to come back up here and reopen the mines that their family mined 150, 200 years ago. Mm. So that's why they come back and check on family holdings every so often to see if it's been disturbed. Okay. Not one time did they give any indication to me that the mine on Hoyt Peak was one of their mines. Okay? They've read the books, and they kind of think, well, okay. Um, but, where they didn't know anything about the Josephine de Martinique has caused me to ponder on a lot of things. And as I've learned Jesuit map code, field code, document code, um, without going into the details, I will, I will emphatically state and hang my hat on it. And, I'm, and I know I don't know everything, so I'll say I'm 98% sure, okay, that the mine on Hoyt Peak is not the Josephine de Martinique mine. And what I've seen over the years are people are using the term Josephine, jo lost Josephine, Josephine de Martinique interchangeably. They are not the same place. And the decoding of the maps does not lead to Hoyt Peak. So you're talking about the decoding of the of the way bill? Of the way bill and, and, and the and the various maps involved. Okay. Okay, is what I'm talking about. And I'm talking about the Bernardo de Miero maps, the Escalante maps. Okay? Okay. They do not decode. And these maps they're looked at as just like a, an, an atlas map so you're gonna travel from from the Gulf of Mexico. To Hoyt Peak, okay. They, they never did maps that way, and I know that that in the history of that mine up there, John Young, you know, was convinced by other people that it was the Josephine, the Lost Josephine mine, and the name is perpetuated. And other people have started to use the same name, you know, using it for that mine, and, and people write stories about it, people publish books about it, they talk about it on TV, and and so pretty soon. Everybody just believes that that's what it is, okay? But when he talks about these students that came up, or the University of Utah students that came 
um, and said they had followed it all the way from um, the Gulf of Mexico to Hoyt Peak. When they say they have a, a map that leads all the way from the Gulf of Mexico to Hoyt Peak, uh, I, ha I have a hard time accepting that because that's not how they did maps. The maps were heavily coded. And think about it. If you had a place that you were trying to guard, why would you give the exact path to get there? I wouldn't. I would decode that map. I would twist it around. I'd flip it over. I would do whatever I could to mislead people. So only the people in the know knew how to decode it and get where it was to be. And the fact that this, this came up, and there's been, I mean, I've never seen the map. That they're talking about they where, where's the I come from an industry where peer review is very important where's the peer review to see if everybody agrees that this is what it's saying versus no it's just my opinion and now my opinion is is doctrine and everybody better believe what I say okay that's kind of how this whole thing with Josephine or the mine on Hoyt Peak has, has evolved and then when you look at the way bill okay the way bill itself is, I mean, I look at that and I see all kinds of Jesuit coding just jumping at me, mm. just jumping at me, and it's it it's not to be read as it is. This stuff is cleverly hidden. I know there's been research about this Joaquin Garcia, the captain, and I I would love to see that additional research. I would love to see and try to track down. Does he have an affiliation? with the Society of Jesus. I don't know. But but how did he in the 1850s or whenever it was he did that that way bill, <clears throat> how does he know <clears throat> excuse me, how does he know the particulars to throw in Jesuit subtle code? And and there's a huge difference between Jesuit code code and and the Spanish then? But the Spanish code and the Jesuit code uh, are not always the same. Think about it. The the if the and, and again the the whole society of Jesus is being researched and try and being figured out. But there is suspicion that the Jesuits were were up to some things that they didn't want to be caught. Okay, and they would misdirect the Spaniards. And why would the Spaniards? You know, the king became aware that they were not. They apparently were mining, which they're not supposed to be mining. Which the Catholic Church has denied that they were ever mining. But all the local, I mean, Indian tribes say that they were enslaved by the black robes to mine. So when the king became aware that they were supposedly mining and that they had been, you know, the Indians were saying they were enslaved, um, the king finally says, well, if you're not going to, if you're mining, you need to pay me my 20% tax. Well, we're not mining. There's no proof that we're mining. And so they set up this whole elaborate system to misdirect the Spaniards. So the Spanish couldn't, couldn't catch what they were doing. And this is stuff that is being researched and figured out that, that we've come to learn that the Jesuits had a whole other agenda going on underneath the, the noses of the Spaniards. And the, the Jesuits, they weren't just Spanish. You had French, Spanish, Italian, German, English, whatever nationality, Portuguese. So when it, when it comes to something like the, the Josephine de Martinique, Okay, um, I have a hard time believing that the, the Spanish, and when you look at the way bill, okay, that we're talking about, that the Spanish would honor a French queen. She was Napoleon's wife. Napoleon had just gone in and conquered Spain, put his brother in as king. They were not happy with one another. Why would you honor a French queen? But the Jesuits, being from all these different countries, would not have a problem honoring a French queen. And when that, those people from Spain and Mexico were talking to me, and they just drew this blank about, we don't know what you're talking about with this Josephine de Martinique. Okay? So, there's a lot more about the Josephine de Martinique I'm not going to talk about. But I am, I am very comfortable to say it is not what's on Hoyt Peak. I would love to see the one on Hoyt Peak being the Lost Josephine or a Je one of the Josephine Mines. I think that'd be wonderful. But it is not the Josephine de Martinique. 
and and the people who have chosen to use that way bill to try to justify what they're thinking uh, for it to be there they're not understanding the coding and um, the, the Jesuits were very very subtle in the use of terminology to throw intruders off and some of the stuff that you and I talked about earlier which I'm not going to talk on here yeah um, that's some of the subtle play on words that they would throw into documents and that's why I would be curious to see if this Captain Garcia had any connection at all to the Society of Jesus. Obviously the, the Escalante maps, Bernardo de Miera, the cartographer, um, he had association with the Society of Jesus. And um, I won't go into the details of that, but he did. Okay. Now, let me put my glasses on for a minute here, see if I've picked up all my notes. Okay. I think I've kind of touched on this, but uh, just so I conclude here, let me just say that just because somebody, in, including myself, and again, I could be wrong, I, I, I make plenty of mistakes, but just because somebody that you think is an authority says it is, doesn't mean it is. Go do your research. Put, put boots on the ground. Go figure it out. Don't toss Charles Kenworthy stuff into the air because you don't like what he was thinking or how he presented stuff or you think it was foolish. Don't just throw it in the trash can because it's dumb. Um, I have found it not to be dumb. I have found it to be very valuable. Um, I have learned to follow that stuff and it's pretty easy. If my wife says I kind of have an obsession and a sickness and she sometimes doesn't like me driving because I'm not paying attention to the road because I'm looking at things and she is sometimes I will hear her say to me do you want me to drive and I say, okay I'll watch the road but then I keep looking off to the side be and, and we've come on to some amazing things uh, over the years and I will I will I will give my support to Charles Kenworthy at least 80 percent and I wish he were alive I would love to talk to him about the other 20 and what he kept out why he kept it out but apparently he had his reasons. Um, and then just in conclusion, uh, I guess I would say this. Over the years I have met um, some very incredible people doing this hobby. Um, very interesting people. I have met some scoundrels that I would not trust for anything. I have met people that I know would give their life to protect me. So as you're as people are out and about and, and learning this stuff and whatever, choose your associates wisely. Because some of them don't don't have the same integrity that maybe you believe they should have or that you have, and they will turn on you and they will they will stab you in the back, they will smear egg on your face, they will discredit you however they can. And with that, I you know just thank you for the opportunity to, to share some stories and my insights on things. And I, I wish I could share more. There's much more, and maybe in the future I can. I'm going to be working on you. I'm going <laughs> to be working on you. And with that said, thank you, Kelly, and that's a wrap.